Welcome everybody to the week three lectures beginning today with English Plantation Society in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, this week we're going to look at the first uh, serious efforts by the English to establish colonies in North America. Uh, we're going to split that view into two different regions, the Chesapeake Bay Colony of Virginia uh, here in this lecture uh, followed by uh, the New England colonies, the Puritan colonies, particularly Massachusetts Bay. Uh, we'll cover that in the other lecture uh, for this week. And in looking at both the Chesapeake and New England, try to get a sense of where the English were coming from, uh, what were their motivations, what were their goals, what were their uh, plans for establishing uh, English colonies in the uh, New World. These are the colonies, of course, that will form the basis of what later becomes the United States of America. And so once again, we start with an empire. And what a great and regal portrait this is of the reigning Queen of England by the late 16th century, Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I of England, who lived from 1533 to 1603, is commemorated here by the artist George Grower uh, and in particular the occasion of England's defeat, famous defeat of the Spanish Armada, the great Spanish fleet that had gone to England in 1588 to exact uh, revenge for the sinking of Spanish ships at sea uh, and to put into place, seemingly put in her place, Queen Elizabeth, the Protestant Queen whom the Spanish Catholics uh, still resented for breaking ranks with the Catholic uh, order in Europe. So two uh, empires, one large and powerful Spain, another rather fledgling and small but ambitious England, meeting in 1588 with England's surprising victory in the Spanish Armada, uh, over the Spanish Armada, we see now the opportunity for England to begin asserting her own imperial interests. And, and this is shown in the painting here. It's fun to, to kind of read this. You see in the background here the ships of the Spanish Armada. Uh, you see all the regal trappings for Queen Elizabeth herself, including the crown, of course. And not coincidentally, you see her hand placed uh, on the globe, uh, suggesting here again England's own imperial ambitions. England would have to find its true measure as a colonial power, an imperial power, and, and perhaps surprisingly uh, to many Americans, that began not with North America, but somewhere much closer to home with the English plan of establishing a Protestant plantation in Catholic Ireland. The word plantation is used often in this era to represent the idea of implanting a settler colony or a trading colony of folk native to the mother country in a foreign land, in this case Ireland. And you see here from the map of the British Isles, uh, the British mainland here adjacent to the Emerald Isle of Ireland. By and large, the Irish had remained staunch Catholics throughout the Protestant Reformation, while England had veered toward the Protestant strand, and so there was plenty of religious animosity between the two, uh, enough to give England a sense of its own imperial conquest mission, uh, almost as if they had borrowed Spain's Reconquista model, which was the effort by the Spanish to drive out the Moors, the so-called Moors, the Muslims, and even the Jews from the Spanish mainland uh, as part of the larger crusading effort. And that, that was successful, by the way, the Spanish Reconquista, in not only driving out uh, the Moors and the non-Christians, but uh, launching Spain's own quest for overseas empire. You recall from the last lecture, the themes of gold, God, and glory. And so the English very much see Ireland uh, in a similar vein, because even though the Irish are Christians, they're Roman Catholic Christians, and to many English Protestants, that, that was akin to being a foreign re faith or a foreign religion. And so seeing the Irish as suitable subjects for English conquest. 
In fact, throughout English culture at the time, easy to find depictions, condescending, uh, insulting depictions of the Irish as the wild Irish, the natives of the island, and these images were used to justify the settling of thousands of English and Scottish settlers on confiscated Irish lands. Here you see a depiction, an English depiction of the wild Irish man uh, next to the wild Irish woman. She seems to be wearing a, some sort of animal skin coat, perhaps, all of which in the minds of English at the time would have marked her as, as inferior, wild, backwards, uncivilized. Uh, that is not flattering portraits of the Irish by any stretch of the imagination. Reading from one English account referring to the Irish as, quote, more uncivil, more uncleanly, more barbarous, and more brutish in their customs and demeanors than in any other part of the world that was known. That's Barnaby Rich, uh, an English uh, colonizer and investor at the time commenting on the English. Another said, the suppressing and reforming of the loose, barbarous, and most wicked life of that savage nation. That's how Peter Carew, another English colonizer, referred to Ireland uh, of Ireland as that savage uh, nation. Their experiments with Irish colonization emboldened the English uh, to look beyond Ireland for other potential uh, places to colonize, for other frontiers of commerce and trade and wealth. Uh, again, we have to see this not as a family-inspired sort of settler effort, but a heavily invested corporate effort to combine the uh, authority of the English crown with the wealth of private English investments. And so, uh, as with most sort of corporate ventures, this particular effort of expansion and colonization was widely promoted throughout England to tempt the wealthy, the rich, the potential investing class uh, into supporting these objects. Uh, in this case, toward the more distant lands of the Americas. Uh, and here again, not unlike the description of I Ireland, uh, the reference to the Americas as remote, heathen, and barbarous lands. This from a famous travel account of the time written by Thomas Harriet. They shall have cause both to fear and love us, writes Harriet, of the Native American peoples who would, according to this account, soon become subjects of the expanding English Empire. And I like this image here from the time. It says Captain Smith, referring to John Smith, who's one of these merchant soldier adventurer types who will lead the English wave across the Atlantic. Uh, but he's surrounded here by other men, gentlemen of English uh, uh, society, that is, men of, of property, men of standing, who are sort of fiddling with and and utilizing the, the, the global instruments of navigation from the compasses to the sextants and, and other navigational tools. Uh, again, to suggest that somehow the English now were, were growing in confidence of their ability to somehow manage the entire earth. Much of the actual work of doing this even before the uh, arrival of, of the initial colonial settlers uh, much of the work of, of enforcing English will upon the high seas was, was left to the so-called privateers, that is, sea captains uh, who worked ostensibly as, as private shipper merchants, but who really carried out the uh, interests of the English crown. Uh, they were also known as sea dogs uh, for their combative, tenacious, uh, ways, particularly their attacks on the Spanish galleons, and you see here an image showing the English sea ships or the English sea dogs and their ships attacking the Spanish galleons below the galleons that were often, of course, of course laden with gold and treasures from America. These were England's conquistadors. You think of the the Spanish and the Portuguese and others as doing the work of the church and the crown and the you know the commerce. Uh, but here it's the English turn, and though the English aren't quite as demonstrably, uh, you know, beholden to the religious expression, you don't typically see this, the crosses sewn into the ships of the 
uh, of the English. Nevertheless, there was a strong compulsion among the English, a strong Protestant compulsion to, uh, to deal with their Catholic rivals and to claim new lands on behalf of the Protestant monarchy of England. Uh, here we see Sir Francis Drake, maybe uh, the most famous of the so-called sea dogs, uh, a consort of Elizabeth herself, a favorite of the Queen. Francis Drake uh, made long-distance navigational voyages uh, as far as, as the Atlantic world, of course, and even the Pacific, where he sailed among the first uh, Europeans to sail into what's now called Drake's Bay, uh, just off the San Francisco Bay. The voyages of Drake and the other English sea dogs uh, help prepare now a potential map of English colonization uh, that would involve them in a basically in a contest for empire that would last uh, the next couple of centuries. Uh, it was understood at the time that uh, really to the victor went the spoils. That is to uh, to try and build empire meant by necessity. Uh, contesting with and dealing with uh, the empire, imperial claims of your rivals, as Sir Walter Raleigh uh, put it, one of these uh, you know merchant adventurer types, a part of a, a powerful investing group in England, as Raleigh put it, that he that commands the sea commands the trade, and he that is lord of the trade of the world is lord of the wealth of the world, and so you can get a sense of that all-encompassing imperial view, that expectation of power and profit that was driving English expansion and the expansion of other countries in Europe as well. These were not pilgrims or humble families looking for religious sanctuary. That's, that's not who was driving English expansion. It's wealthy investors looking for profit at the behest of the English crown. And you see the insignias of the various merchant companies, the joint stock, uh, regally chartered companies, uh, all the uh, trappings of crown and king uh, and wealth and power in these insignias. The one you're looking at here comes from the so-called Virginia Company, established in 1606 uh, by English investors who received permission from the crown to write up royal grants and charters that would allow them to establish plantations in North America. Uh, initially, uh, some years earlier, that effort led by Walter Raleigh had tried and failed to establish a colony down here in the Carolina region uh, at Roanoke. The famous lost colony of Roanoke was, uh, was poorly supplied, poorly administered, and ultimately overrun by native resistance. And so it became the lost uh, colony. Uh, more successful now would be the efforts to establish here in the Chesapeake Bay region uh, a permanent English colony whose foothold uh, at a place called Jamestown. And, and Jamestown is named for uh, the new monarch of England, King James, uh, here along what the English will now call the James River. In 1607, Jamestown is founded uh, as a corporate venture uh, staffed with uh, with set, not so much settlers as merchant adventurers and those who are in the employment of merchant uh, adventurers. No, no families yet. No uh, uh, family settlers uh, to speak of in Virginia. And as it turns out, uh, Jamestown is the winning ticket for the English uh, because although it suffered mightily uh, in the early years from poor provisioning, poor planning and uh, overall sort of poor uh, understanding of the land and its requirements, it does survive to become now England's first successful transatlantic American colony, Jamestown, uh, Virginia. Virginia is the name the English gave to the region, uh, that is uh, the larger region uh, on the Chesapeake, named for the Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth, who never married. Uh, Jamestown for her successor, King James. The seeds had been planted the previous year in 1606 when investors in the Virginia Company received the royal grants to establish plantations in North America uh, with the first settlement in 1607 being Jamestown. In the charter uh, given by King James to the Virginia Company, uh, it read 
which may, quote, which may by the providence of Almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of his divine majesty and propagating of Christian religion and may in time bring the infidels and slaves living in those parts to human civility and to a settled and quiet uh, government. This word, I beg your pardon, this word should be savages, not slaves, uh, let alone saves. So I'll make a correction there. But in time bring the infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and to settled and quiet government. So uh, sort of in a nutshell here are the uh, the the sort of triple goals of gold, God, and glory. That is the expectation of profit, uh, conquest in the name of uh, the religious doctrines, and finally the uh, subjugation of native peoples and rivals. It's pretty much all there in that short short excerpt. And as I say, the English establish a successful plantation enterprise at Jamestown in 1607. Jamestown becomes thus the first English settlement in, in North America to, to succeed, to survive, uh, and thus is the answer to a, a trivia question. In effect, the first uh, of what would become the United States of America, the first successful town ventures, uh, the earliest successful town venture established by the uh, by the English. The high and principal end being plantation of an English church and commonwealth and consequently the conversion of the heathen is how the, uh, again, how the charter put it. Uh, Richard Hacklett, who was a, uh, a prominent travel writer at the time, uh, listed uh, the three priorities very simply to plant Christian religion. One, uh, two, to traffic, which meant uh, commerce and trade, and three, uh, to conquer. Although I don't think we have to suppose that it was always in that order. Those seem to be the driving ambitions of the English. And, and nowhere do you see there in these early uh, proclamations anything about uh, to provide for the settlement of families, uh, to the establishment of religious uh, liberties or toleration, nothing like that. The men who supported these early English ventures were men of business and commerce. Many of them had military connections. All of them were staunch supporters of the Protestant establishment in England. Uh, and thus, uh, it just simply wasn't included in their thinking uh, that initially, at least, this would have much to do with actual families uh, settling in North America, English families. It took a few years, but within about a decade, by 1616, a successful merchantable commodity, as the English put it, had been found in Virginia, something that could sustain the needs of the Jamestown colony by providing the basic necessities of wealth and income uh, from which they could then begin to purchase the provisions and expand their settlement. And that successful cash crop, that merchantable commodity, as it turns out, was Native American tobacco. Uh, that is, despite the early hopes that uh, it, there would be no need to turn to agriculture for profit, that there would be plenty of other treasures awaiting, perhaps gold or other fine gems awaiting in the soils of America. That proved not to be the case, of course. Uh, but instead, it, uh, it turned out it was a different kind of gold. The gold grown in a, uh, a rich, the rich alluvial soil of Virginia, and that being tobacco, a Native American crop, which will soon become all the craze of England. Life is a smoke, read one testimonial. If this be true, tobacco will thy life renew. Then fear not death, nor killing care, whilst we have best Virginia here. So a testimonial for Virginia tobacco. Uh, and it's true that by 1616, hundreds of smoke shops selling Virginia tobacco had been established in London. This had become uh, a kind of merchant merchandising craze, uh, the smoking of English tobacco. One of the few dissenters was King James himself, who referred to tobacco as that vile weed, maybe the first anti-smoking track issued by the king himself. But for many others, it was a fairly cheap, uh, 
pretty seriously addictive habit to develop uh, that guaranteed uh, the marketers of tobacco and the growers of tobacco back in Virginia a continued uh, customer base. This led to a land craze in Virginia. Uh, that is, more and more investors and even settlers and planters coming to Virginia buying up so-called head rights of land uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 acres or more, depending on your, your wherewithal. A head right system of land sales first carried out by the Virginia Company and then later taken over by the English Crown when the Virginia Company disbanded. Uh, throughout the Chesapeake Bay and the river systems of Virginia, uh, you'll see a land boom, a land craze, where tobacco and cattle, uh, along with settlers from England, begin to populate the Chesapeake Bay. Many of the structures, the early homes, were fairly modest, uh, woodcut, timber, framed uh, dwellings, cottages and the like that looked rather like the cottages back in England. Uh, but it did offer uh, those who were referred to as men of small means, that is, not just wealthy investors like a Walter Raleigh or a Thomas Hacklett, but men of smaller means, men who had perhaps uh, a smaller fortune uh, or savings to invest, maybe having made some capital in England uh, as shopkeepers or, or landowners selling off their property, uh, allowing men, in other words, of ordinary wealth to purchase these head rights of 50 acres or more, uh, sometimes receiving an additional 50 acres if they just promise to implant uh, and import servants to the Chesapeake. Because remember, tobacco would be a very labor-intensive crop and one that would require the additional laboring um, inputs uh, from, from England. And so enticing English servant indentured servants uh, to come to the Chesapeake was also part of this promotional scheme. Now, of course, you might be wondering, well, what about the native people? I mean, all this land grabbing, it must have created conflict. And of course, you would be right. Brutal wars over control of land will be fought by the English and their allies against the native people. And recall that this is all seen within the rubric of a crusading spirit. That is a culture of war that's been going on in Europe for centuries already. The Chesapeake uh, Bay region was home to some 20,000 native people spread across 160 villages at the time of English arrival. Uh, and certainly well organized politically, these native people of the Chesapeake and their various tribal alliances meant that they uh, were capable of resisting the English uh, and their conquistador dream, what was called the Powhatan Confederacy in particular, led by figures uh, like the Powhatan chieftain himself uh, and his, uh, his brother, Opakushkano, who you see here, uh, depicted by an English sketch artist. Uh, these were the men who ruled the native societies of the Chesapeake as tribal leaders, uh, as political unifiers, and as, uh, as warriors capable of resisting uh, the English at almost every turn. Uh, but the English are a stubborn, uh, ambitious people who return their own uh, aggression and violence against the natives uh, in what becomes, in, a, in effect, a kind of war of uh, attrition. Uh, it wasn't necessary to simply kill native people directly. You could you could, uh, you could do great harm just by dramatically altering their habitat, by ruining their crops and, and burning their forests and, and implanting Virginia tobacco, you know, in places where food had once been grown. The idea here was not to civilize the native people, obviously, but to remove them. So despite the proclamations of, of English investors and others and the crown, you know, uh, claiming to, to Christianize and civilize. Uh, it was pretty much a war of, of vanquishment, of removal against the native people. Listen to Virginia Governor Francis Wyatt. Our first work is expulsion of the savages to gain the free range of the country for increase of cattle, swine, etc. It is infinitely better to have no heathen among us who at best were but as thorns in our sides than to be at peace and league with them. Hard to be clearer than that. And along with private property and fences, tobacco and cattle would come the need 
now to find reliable laborers, to purchase, in effect, a laboring population uh, that could act as a subservient class to the, uh, the tobacco planters and plantation owners, a laboring population that initially uh, is assumed to be drawn from England in the form of, of so-called indentured servants. It just so happens that there was a kind of surplus population in England by the late 1580s, uh, thanks to uh, the various uh, vicissitudes of the English economy and the land enclosure system. An entire population of people had essentially been la left landless and homeless. Uh, the famous uh, beggars of Mother Goose nursery rhymes uh, that gave cause to worry, I think, to uh, the English government and to wealthy property and interests because you had this sort of rootless kind of transient class of people in England that were tempted I think often to turn to crime and so the Americas and the colonies become a kind of safety valve outlet for that that is by gathering these these impoverished folk English folk uh, together and either voluntarily or by coercion you know inducing them to travel to England or to uh, England's colonies in Virginia and elsewhere as, as servants uh, but really as one English proprietor put it uh, in, you know America had become the colonies of America had become a sink to drain England of her filth and scum a harsh indictment of the English lower classes here you see a sketch of an English debtor's person. Remember, in those uh, times, it was uh, unlawful to be indebted uh, without the ability to pay. And so the sort of social policy was to criminalize debt by putting people in literal prisons, sometimes whole families in prisons, uh, and forcing them to work for slave wages until their debts were paid off. George Downing wrote a letter to the Honorable John Winthrop, colonial governor of Massachusetts in 1645, Massachusetts being the English colony north of Virginia. Quote, planters who want to make a fortune in the West Indies must procure white slave, or white slave labor out of England if they wanted to succeed. This a letter from one of the sponsors of the English colonies to the governor of the uh, Massachusetts colony, pretty much recognizing that the labor requirements were a necessity uh, for success. And so it is that England's surplus population of sturdy beggars offered an initial labor force. And I remind my students sometimes, you know, I've had over the years many students approach me to, uh, to, uh, to claim that, you know, they had done their family history and their ancestors had come uh, to the country in this early colonial period. Often, uh, you know, I've been told aboard the Mayflower, the famous, famous p pilgrim uh, vessel that we remember in the Thanksgiving uh, holiday celebration. Uh, and yet this provides a kind of distorted uh, view, uh, I think, of what really was going on. The, the vast majority of those now who are going to be coming to the colonies of Virginia and the other English colonies are coming not as sort of sturdy settler folk with families, but really coming as bedraggled, impoverished, perhaps imprisoned, indentured servants who really are desperate at any opportunity, even a harsh opportunity, such as the Virginia to tobacco fields offered, to find some measure of independence. So fears of social chaos and rebellion in England, rather than calls for liberty or religious freedom, really provide the impetus for most of the, the migration in these early years. And we're reminded of this, you know, in the familiar ch children's nursery rhymes, the Mother Goose rhymes and others, Tom Tom the Piper's son stole a pig and away did run. The pig was eat and Tom was beat and Tom went crying down the street. We teach these things, you know, to children and they're, they're rather dark, uh, you know, even violent rhymes that are direct product of these years of, of social chaos or fears of social chaos and rebellion in England. And, and chances are Tom, depicted here as a thief, a pig thief, uh, after God is beating, uh, probably ended up as an intentioned servant going to Virginia. So this combined with a high demand for field workers, uh, workers who could tend to most labor-intensive cash crop, that is the crop of uh, tobacco, the the golden weed, as its supporters called it, the vile 
wheat as King James called it. Uh, in 1624, already 200,000 pounds annually of Virginia tobacco leaf being harvested uh, and exported uh, to Europe and England. By 1638, that, that number had grown exponentially to over 3 million pounds of Virginia tobacco leaf. Uh, and it wasn't just Virginia, it was also the neighbor, neighboring colony of, of Maryland across the bay that would come to cultivate tobacco. And tobacco would be just then the, the first of the successful English crop ventures that the English uh, undertake. Tobacco, interestingly, uh, was a Native American uh, crop, a domesticated crop, sometimes grown semi-wild, other times domesticated by Native Americans who used it for its narcotic or stimulant, I should say, stimulant effect, uh, or even claiming certain medicinal effects. Uh, it was embraced as a recreational drug, uh, a stimulant, among other things, by the English who began now cultivating this native crop in much, much larger quantities, as we can see. We know that ultimately among those committed to laboring in the new world, of course, will be Africans, uh, unwilling laborers, if you will, those kidnapped or sold or bartered into slavery. And the first Africans to arrive in Virginia come in 1619. But in some ways that's misleading because this uh, coffle of slaves brought by a Dutch trading ship uh, will introduce Africans to the Chesapeake, but not... Uh, sustain any kind of large importation of Africans until many years later when England was better uh, positioned to take a share of the Atlantic slave trade. But nevertheless, the first Africans then imported to the Virginia colony, the first of the English successful English colonies, uh, coming in 1619. Uh, the cost was still too prohibitive, too expensive, and the supply too uncertain. And so for the time being, the English planters will rely on, an, on English indentured servants. Of course, that will change. Instead, a system of indentured servitude using, quote, loose and vagrant people, basically poor people from England, to do the work of laboring, the hard work of laboring in the Virginia tobacco field. It's estimated that about 90,000 poor, propertyless English servants went to Virginia in the 1600s. And there they lived harsh and often short lives, uh, high mortality rates, uh, low life expectancy. All of this a result of not only a new climate with new uh, environmental hazards, uh, one of which I'll mention was malaria, uh, the importation of flies uh, from the Eastern Hemisphere, probably Africa, that carried the contagion of malaria that proved often fatal to those unaccustomed, including English servant laborers working in the fields where uh, I said flies a minute ago. Of course, I meant mosquitoes. Some things don't change. Mosquitoes carry the, uh, uh, the malaria contagion uh, in their blood, and when they uh, they bite uh, a living host like a human being, that uh, contagion can be uh, transmitted, uh, creating a devastating effect uh, of mortality due to malaria. Um, the heat and oppressive climate, at least to English people, used to cool uh, climate, fog, uh, rain, etc. A harsher climate, uh, by their way of thinking in Virginia, hot, steamy summers, harsh, cold, bitter winters, uh, really took a toll on people, not to mention the unremitting need for laboring in the field, just the hard work, back-breaking work in the fields. All of this led to a high mortality rate among the English and really stifled in Virginia at least the possibility of something like family settlements. Uh, when, when the mother died or the father died, the kids were left orphaned, and when the kids died, it stifled the growth of a native-born population. So most of the advantage, most of the fortunes, went not to those who labored in the earth, but those who invested in the markets, those who invested in the land. Uh, so fortunes for the few and hard lives for the many. That's the story of, of early American uh, history. And here you see a, a sketch drawing showing the disparity uh, in accommodations. Uh, on the left here, the wealthy upscale uh, plantation homes, 
a bottom paid for with the profits of tobacco, the middling size home of the, the man of middle means, and then finally sort of down the scale to what would be the laborers, cottages, uh, or shacks. So uh, a clear class divide developing in early Virginia between the haves and the have-nots. But make no mistake, the overall power uh, from the wealth uh, derived in the fields, the tobacco fields, was enough to create a kind of uh, elite class, uh, a tobacco kingdom, if you will, ruled by a tidewater elite. The tidewater is a reference to the Chesapeake Bay and the rivers of Virginia that uh, advance and recede with the tide. Here's a great image, one of my favorites of what we might call the, the, the tobacco fiefdom. You know, you see the great plantation home depicted on the perch of a hill here, but beneath it all the subsidiary parts, the tobacco sheds, the servants' quarters, the ships suggesting commerce pulling right up to the dock of the plantation. Um, this is a self-contained community. Uh, depicted with all the native flora, even uh, wine grapes uh, ensconcing themselves, a kind of Edenic paradise almost, uh, louding the power and authority of the Tidewater elite, and really masking any clear view of the kind of class discrepancy, the, the serious divide between the haves and the have-nots. But the other thing this picture shows us is how this world was connected to that larger Atlantic world that we have spoken of, not just England, uh, but the larger Atlantic world, because whether it be uh, African laborers who will eventually come, or markets for American tobacco on the continent of Europe, or even globally, ultimately to the Far East, uh, this is a scene that is uh, in many ways tightly connected to that larger Atlantic world, a larger network of economic and laboring connections that will have uh, global consequences. And the self-styled gentry that ran the whole thing in, in Virginia, that is, those, you know, one percenters, if you will, who become the great elite uh, political economic uh, of Virginia, who called themselves the gentry after the tradition of English gentlemen. Uh, not literally nobility, these men were self-made uh, or self-invested, uh, but they took on the trappings of English nobility. Uh, often born from hard-driving merchants, uh, these tobacco planters are the sort of Darwinian champions, those who survive uh, are the survival of the fittest, you might say, like the Carter family. This portrait of John Carter uh, has the trappings of English aristocracy, even though Carter's father, Robert King Carter, had made his own fortune, was not of the, the gentry class of England, was not of the nobility of England, uh, but had made a fortune in Virginia tobacco uh, and bought his son this mansion as a wedding gift in 1723 on one of the uh, on one of the uh, Tidewater rivers. So much like the English nobility with their great country estates, uh, but very different as well because they were not a part of the uh, noble class of England, but hard-driving merchants, as I say, and tobacco planters who create a, a self-styled uh, English gentry here in the New World. And it was their very wealth and power and perhaps arrogance, not to mention the great and growing class divide between the haves and the have-nots, that actually sparked a violent rebellion, a destructive rebellion, called Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. And Bacon's Rebellion is brought on by the declining tobacco prices. As the markets of England become saturated with the surplus of tobacco, the prices begin to fall, the revenue drives up, good land becomes scarce, and those who are left on the outside wanting a piece of the action become more and more restive at what they see as what they see as the, the arrogance and uh, and aristocratic bearing of the Tidewater uh, elite. Nathaniel Bacon, the leader uh, whose name signifies the Rebellion of 76, was himself part of the, the real English gentry who had come to Virginia hoping to replicate the success of his family, but instead found most of the good land gone and an arrogant cohort dominating the politics in Jamestown uh, who had little time for him or his uh, grievances. So Bacon will organize a rebellion made up of, of poor farmers, indentured servants, uh, who will begin to attack 
the institutions of the wealthy, attacked their homes, even burning the capital town of Jamestown to the ground at one point. Now, eventually, Bacon's Rebellion is put down, but it it moves to action the Virginia gentry, who realize now that having such a large propertyless servile class of English laborers, former laborers living in the Chesapeake, was to invite continued rebellion. What they wanted was a new laboring population of non-English, non-indentured servants. Uh, and it was at this time, uh, at a time of heightened social class tension between the various classes of white Virginians that the decision is made to turn toward African slavery that is the the labor of African enslaved African people which the English were now in a better position by the 1670s and 80s to get a hold of because of the weakening grip of the Spanish on the Atlantic slave trade and in effect the English will buy the rights to trade African slaves from the Spanish, the uh, famous uh, asiento or permission to trade slave rights that had been granted by the Spanish crown. And so the English would become full-time slave traders now. And, and not surprisingly, the number of African slaves living in the Chesapeake will grow dramatically from only about 300 in 1650 to 13,000 by 1700. Uh, and, uh, and by 1750, uh, more than 150,000 enslaved uh, African, mostly enslaved African people living and, and working as enslaved people in the Chesapeake. Now we're going to have more to say about slavery uh, as we go along, but for now as we finish this lecture on the Chesapeake, this initial look at the English settlement of the Americas uh, in the Chesapeake Bay region, uh, it reminds us of something important uh, about our history and the uh, history that was then still to come. Uh, that the much vaunted uh, American freedom, uh, that is the, the the defense of liberties and the the cries for freedom that down to our own times still are potent politically and otherwise, that American freedom itself was in a basic way built on the backs first of poor English servants and then increasingly on the backs of American slavery. And what I mean by this is that uh, many of those who we would come to call and regard as our founding fathers. Let's take George Washington, for example. George Washington is born and raised in the Virginia Tidewater elite, uh, part of that elite class, uh, who becomes, of course, a hero of the American Revolution. Remember that, that George Washington, often referred to as the father of his country, uh, was also a slave owner. That is, the Washington family was part of the Virginia Tidewater elite of slave owning and tobacco growing, and that his own wealth and position, which allowed him to pursue his ambitions as a military officer, first under the British and then as an American patriot, was made possible by the wealth of his family and his own home of course, Mount Vernon, a beautiful estate. You can still visit it high above uh, the Potomac River, the bluff above the Potomac. Uh, not unlike the picture we saw a few minutes ago, uh, a, a well-connected, prosperous plantation family uh, whose wealth was made possible by the labor of unfree people and whose political career subsequently was made possible. So the architects of American freedom themselves resting on a foundation of American slavery. And this, of course, is a fascinating paradox, a great contradiction of American history that has really uh, haunted us in many ways as a country ever since. So we'll have to see, uh, have a lot more to say about this in, in some of the lectures to come. Uh, but for now, uh, that is our first introduction to uh, the history of early colonial America. <laughs>